Okay, so have you ever been to a website where you click a few items and then somehow in the bottom it says, oh, people who like this also like that kind of stuff. Seen before, right? What about things like, uh, uh, if you like this, you might also like something like that. Have seen before, right? That those things are called recommenders, you know? So the concept behind those actions are called recommender systems. So it's like a computerized way of finding stuff that is similar to what you're interested in and showing up for you. So the, the idea behind a recommender system is basically to get you to buy as many things as possible, right? And sometimes, you know, like Netflix, sometimes they would give you recommendations based on your uh, watch history, right? So they give you, you watch a few things, or maybe you remember <clears throat> if you have Netflix, when you first got onto Netflix, they asked you to check out, you know, like take a few uh, genres you like, right? And then, and then the reason why they want to do that is because you have not yet got your watch history, right? <clears throat> so, so they will recommend you based on the genre, the, the category of uh, shows that you like. So all in all, I think no matter if it's a, uh, uh, streaming websites or a e-commerce website, the people who give you recommendations. One thing is that, I mean, one thing I'm sure the, the, the motivation is based on they can get you to watch as many as possible or also buy as many as possible or, uh, you know, but also sometimes I find that actually quite useful. Uh, how many of you use Spotify? Huh? Anybody use Spotify? The music, yeah, the music streaming website. I use it myself, lah. Sometimes I find myself uh, basically I listen to uh, those music, and then sometimes I get bored because they only have a few songs, and I kept on playing the same songs over and over again, and then starts to be bored. And when I'm playing it on Spotify, sometimes when you look at the the artist page. On the right hand side, there are artists who are like this artist, you know, so I can actually check them out. And sometimes I find some really good artists that I like, and that's really helpful. Right. OK, so so that is basically the, the basis of recommender system is to generate similar items or viewing um categories that you guys may like and then presenting it to you as a suggestion so i think more and more these days you get to see a lot more of these happening right for example if you go to lazada or or shopee they show you your your browse history at the bottom right and then they also say you may like right you may like something and i don't know how they actually generate that you may like because when i look for stuff on on shopee I always go for top sales, you know. I go for the ones that people bought the most. There must be a good reason why people buy that a lot, right? Either it's really cheap or at least it's reliable or something. Um, so, so, so each website would actually try to do some kind of recommendation for you. And sometimes, have you guys also noticed that if you go to some websites, for example, uh, Maxis or uh, Cellcom, sometimes they have the chatbot on the side, right? The chatbot on the side, and then there is a selection. You can select, do you want a customer service or do you want to uh, sort of, uh, rec you know, do you want to look at our services and do you want to sort of like get some recommendations? And then they'll ask you a few, a series of questions about yourself. Do you like to do a uh, weekend or do, do you like to call people on the nighttime or do you like to, you know, these kind of questions. So they can give you some suggestions. And the reason why that is important because without these so selections and choices, they can't really make a further deduction on what you may also like. So that is all the things Then people really don't, don't know. I mean, unless you're in the, the data science community and you've been doing this for a while, you will know what recommender systems are. Otherwise, you will, you will know it as something as suggestions from the website, right? Suggestions from the website for further purchases or more, more ideas. Huh? So today's content is uh, knowing to 
get to know the concept of recommender systems. And then once we know that, we're going to build a simple recommender system. We're actually going to build two because one of them is they, they both have their own sort of uh, merits, and some of them are uh, basically you can get to explore several several recommended systems that is based on uh, what people buy and then giving suggestions and finding things that has uh, relevancy between each other and so on. And we're going to look into that kind of a uh, hands-on this afternoon. So we're going to have two hands-ons today. And before that, we're going to look at the recommended systems as a uh, an avenue for for corporate to to get to gauge uh, connection with the customer and also give suggestions like tailored suggestions. In the past, I think without these recommender systems, people just give suggestions as things that the top seller, right? Things that is in the shop that is like this is what we most people buy. So you come and look at it. Maybe you're interested in it, right? But sometimes, for example, I think in in some of the skincare shops, uh, I remember Kiel ha has uh, this one one shelf that has the top sellers, and then you go in there, and the top sellers are are very much to to uh, sort of like moisturizing and then very anti-aging and stuff. But sometimes uh, people may have their own sort of concerns. For example, they may have pimples, they may have uh, sort of oily skin or something. So the, the, the top sellers may not apply to them as a recommendation. But all in all, in the past when recommendations, I think if you think about recommendations like from the lo long, long time ago, people go into a shop and then sales assistant come to you. So what are you looking for? Uh? And then based on your reply, they would actually say, oh, actually this one, you can try this, this, and this, right? So if people are just based on their experience to give you recommendations. But nowadays, because things are done very much online, it's very hard to get the customer service agents to actually get to you face to face and then talk to you, right? Because there's so many customers browsing the e-commerce website at, in one go. It's not possible to engage e each and every, every customer with a customer service agent. So that's why it is important to actually have these kind of recommender systems so that they can actually help uh, or they can actually tailor the suggestions to that client. And sometimes I think if some suggestions given to me that I feel quite relevant, I feel, oh, actually, this is quite good. Because sometimes even grocery shopping, I don't know if you're, if you're like me, I sometimes see new product, I think, ah, oh, maybe I can try this. I, some of my friends, they're like, I don't want to try new things. I just want to go for that one I like. I know what I like, you know? I know what I like. This is the one I go for. So that is another way of looking at buying stuff. But for me, I actually do sometimes look at new stuff and think, oh, maybe this one will be better. Let's just buy a small bottle and try it. And that sometimes leads to quite successful. And then, then I move my, my holy grail to the new one. And that actually just, you know, sometimes new products does have their good points because the, the new products sometimes have new research onto it. And for example, if you have some new products that actually have one, have two usages instead of one, or, or if they're actually accommodating some new things, or they're even more quality and more eco economic than the one you had before, then why not? And that is basically the general background and foundation of how the recommender systems come about. Whenever there is a data science or machine learning technique or field that is new or arising, it's because there is a need. There is a need for a new thing that comes out because either people can handle it or people don't want to handle it. For example, yesterday, NLP was used to sort of uh, you know, stream through all these complaints or all these surveys, doing things that human don't really want to spend time on, or maybe don't have enough time to spend on to, to do those things, and you get computerized stuff to do it for you. So in this case, this recommended systems is basically like that. And um, so yeah. let me see if I can. Uh, Two. 
Okay, so I don't know if you guys have seen this yesterday. I think I mentioned this movie before. Um, it's the Minority Report. I don't know if you still remember that scene. Uh, I don't know if there if you guys can hear this or not. Oh, you guys don't have earphones, right? Wait ah, uh, let me let me and just put my my laptop be loud. Okay, so, okay, the, those of you who have never seen Minority Report before, this scene is uh, basically Tom Cruise is a fugitive, and he, uh, this is set in the future, and then he was being accused that he's going to commit a crime at some time in the future, and then, and he's on the run, and then, uh, because in the future, person's identity is tied to their iris ID. So he managed to get on the black market a, a pair of eyeballs from a Japanese person. And when he goes into a shop, people identify each other by using the, the eyes. And then, um, so he was mistaken as somebody else. So you will see him being called Mr. Yakamoto. <clears throat> and that is because his identity has been swapped a bit. Oh, this is not the one this is the, when he was still. Imagination. Okay. Uh, give me a second. I'm gonna need to copy this and put it in the. All right. Here's the link. So you can see, like, in the future, I think this is what's going to happen. If, if judging by what Elon Musk is about to do, I think this is probably going to happen pretty soon. I'm still a little bit, you know, shook by, by what Elon Musk is about to do. I don't want to open up my skull, you know. I think, I think my skull is as good as it is the way my mom actually gave me. <laughs> Personally, I think, I think the, the part of personal sort of... Uh, personal modification for for technology for me i think it's i'm gonna have to wait this is not something i'm gonna explore the first day is coming out like something like a samsung phone or something that that phone i can sort of get on board but body modification i i am afraid not that is just not gonna happen oh dear so so basically this is the kind of stuff that um, people envision what's going to happen, and you can tell the way that um, the way that the all of these avenues advertising. So nowadays, I think the closest thing to this that you guys see is is probably that walkway in KLCC, right? That walkway in KLCC, you get to see all these advertisements, but they're like like posters, but in sort of like with lights, right? In the future, I'm guessing those advertisements would be sort of screens, and then there will be some kind of a, I don't know if RFID, RFID or some kind of identification that when you walk past, they will know it's you. For example, now I think in China, there are so many CCTV cameras out there that when people walk around, you kind of um, get spotted by 
by the government that when they know where you are and they can spot who you are. And I think in the future, this is, everything is like, um, didn't they say sort of like research will first uh, be a demand by the government and then gradually, uh, gradually getting adopted by the commercials. So I'm guessing this is what's gonna happen, isn't it? So you can see the way that, uh, the way that, the advertisements are actually given to to people. They're actually saying that person's name. I'm guessing in the future, if they're saying the person's name, they're probably gonna say it to the person through a sort of listening device of that person or or maybe in a more subtle way because imagine a very busy kind of walkway and there's like hundreds of people walking at the same time. They cannot afford having this, everybody's name said out loud and some more, uh, it's a privacy concern, right? Because if you're walking around and then some somewhere comes out with your name, that's just not right, isn't it? I think in a way for us, they really should not sort of simply say our name out loud. And also, I don't think it's a good thing to have our sort of profile be recorded by commercial commercial people. And then they get to have our sort of, you know, iris, iris details or any other sort of personalized details. because Imagine our privacy stuff being taken away from uh, or being being adopted by a commercial company and they somehow get hacked because that's all things gets hacked nowadays, right? When they get hacked and then we don't know where our information are going and then we may be subjected to some crime. That is not good. Um, I'm sure when something like uh, recommended systems getting adopted by by getting adopted by the, the whole commercial world, some kind of a cybersecurity governance is gonna come along and that will probably make it more secure. But as of now, the type of recommended systems that we are actually encountering are all online e-commerce, right? All the online e-commerces and we are, I think I'm also feeling a bit of sort of uh, impact of that because every time in the past, it's just Amazon, Spotify, I don't really see it being so widespread. Nowadays, I go into just simply any e-commerce. E Sometimes at the bottom, they would actually give you recommendations already. Sometimes those recommendations are not relevant. Huh? It's, uh, it's actually, it depends on what you feed to it. Have you guys noticed that uh, when you go to an e-commerce website or some website, they ask you, do you want to sign up? When you, they ask you to sign up, some websites actually ask you some questionnaires, right? They ask you questionnaires such as, uh, basically, uh, you know, you know, what is your income bracket? What is your age? And then, I usually don't apply that. <laughs> so, um, but for those stuff, for example, they'll ask you, do you, are you looking for skincare that is for this, this purpose, this purpose, or because that's sort of like e-commerce for skincare, or if you are going to a website that is for like, for example, um, other type of things, they will give you other type of questionnaires, is because they want to tie that kind of profile to your profile, right? And when they, when they're recommending stuff to you, they will use that as a guideline to select stuff to, you know, refer to you or to suggest to you. So sometimes also, uh, we all have a Google account, right? You, you know, when you recently when you um, go into Google, have you guys noticed that um, they have uh, sort of if you go into Google, I think it's a privacy thing, the data you get to sort of set some settings, right? You get to dictate um, do do you want advertisement tailored to you, or do you want advertisement tailored to everybody and not just you? things like that. So, and do you want to keep your, your YouTube browsing history on, on the web and stuff like that, right? So all of these are basically your, your browsing histories, right? Same as when you go to YouTube. When you go to YouTube, when you browse a few, watch a few things, and then suddenly you click refresh, there's all the other things, right? There was this joke, it says that um, I checked out how to fix iPhone once, and then from now on, all of the stuff that I see is how to fix iPhone stuff. 
it just shows that um, when you when you do some kind of browsing on YouTube, they definitely store your browsing history, right? They definitely store your browsing preference, and that will affect what they recommend to you. And sometimes it's a bit annoying because I, I go on the website, and then I go to Facebook, and I browse a few things, and then suddenly on the right-hand side of the Google search, suddenly there is these kind of stuff that advertise for, isn't it? it have you guys noticed the Google search? On the right-hand side, there's a panel that has sometimes got uh, advertisements, right? And those advertisements are so linked to what you have just browsed that I was thinking, I just browsed it. I never really intend to, you know, for you to give me recommendations. I think it's just recommendations going overboard that they are trying to make all the opportunities to actually suggest things to you that is becoming a little bit uh, too much. I think there is a subtlety that you should actually adopt when you're trying to. It's, it's what they say, like soft sell or hard sell, right? Like people are more open to soft selling than it is to hot selling hot or cold selling. For example, if you go into a, a place or sometimes they will come to you, you walk on the street, sometimes people come up to you, right? Especially those credit card uh, companies and they will just say, you know, do you want a credit card? And sometimes I walk past, I was thinking, do I look like somebody who buys a lot of stuff? <laughs> like, oh, maybe maybe I'm giving off the, the, the look that maybe I buy a lot of stuff. Um, but I think they do that to everyone, right? They, they try to try to uh, get hold of everyone to try to get them to sign up on credit cards and so on. And so that is the basis of, of a recommended system. We're going to look at a few things in detail of what it is, the types of it. So from now on, we're going to talk about like recommend this system uh, from the point of view of a data scientist in terms of what it is and stuff. But just now I was mentioning things that is more from the point of view of a consumer. And now, now from the advertiser's point of view, recommend system is a godsend because you're, you don't have to pay labor to the people to actually advertise for you. For example, if you are a shop, and then you have to pay your own staff to to basically recommend stuff to people when they come in, right? And if you have a computer that does this for you, you probably just pay a fee to start with, and then that will just keep on going uh, forever and ever. And that's why it's so enticing. Even some of the smaller smaller shops are actually doing this nowadays. So this is the sections we're going to be looking through. We're going to look at what is recommender systems more in sort of detail, and then uh, what kind of recommender systems out there. And that the second part right here, the, the third part, the types of recommender systems is something that uh, we need to know as a data scientist because this type of recommender systems would, would dictate what kind of stuff that you will be getting. For example, there are things that is based on what the kind of stuff you like or based on what kind of person you are. And then from, from there, once we get to know the, the, the ins and outs of recommended system, we're going to do these two hands-ons. One is called the a priori algorithm. The other one is called the SVD. Uh, these two are, are used a lot for uh, building a recommender system. Cases where you, you're wondering what kind of movie or TV show to watch, for example, on Netflix, or board of music that you're, you're currently playing for Spotify, for example, and what kind of best products to buy based on your preference. Obviously, to have this kind of recommendation as in best products, you just need to, uh, first of all, best products can be considered as top sellers and so on. But if it's best products for your preference, then that means you would have to give your preference to begin with, right? You have to tell them what you like to buy and what kind of stuff you're interested in so that they can give you a tailored suggestion of, um, of things to buy. I think a lot of these days there is a sort of a thing that people tend to tend to sort of promote especially from the advertiser's point of view, is, uh, is something that is tailor-made for you. For example, a suit that you buy from a shop, 
like ready-made, you have to find the, the shape or the, the size to, that's according to you. But the things that's from the shelf are not tailored to your own sort of body shape, uh, especially. So that's why the, the kind of tailoring shops that measures your your measurements and then goes and create for it like tailor-made custom-made or um, these kind of services is considered quite how to put it um, sort of a premium service right so it means that it's actually tailoring to your needs similar to that um, tailored service in terms of websites, I think in a way they're also trying to promote a feeling of, you know, we are, you are our valued customer and we are giving you this tailor-made rec recommendations just for you, just for you and you and things that you like, all the things here that suggested is based on your preferences and that's why, uh, that's why they are much more, uh, because much more sort of preferred because that shows our dedication to you personally as a customer. Obviously that is the case for all of their customers if they have recommendations, right? But to individual customers, maybe that could make them feel a little bit more uh, valued or, you know, because you make this one for me, maybe it's just tailored for me only. Recommended systems uh, is basically a tool and technique provide suggestions so the suggestive uh, recommendations is what it's used for and there is con there's content filtering and then collaborative filtering so there's two top types of filtering systems as a uh, applied data science this is what you need to know so if you are someone who are moving from a consumer to somebody who is knowing the back end of a particular technique. This will differentiate you from people who are users to people who are going to be, um, you know, applying this as a technique. So content filtering and collaborative filtering are only going to be, um, you know, interested by the people who want to create recommender systems. Which uh, based, I'm hoping that you guys are those people. So. Content filter, collaborative filtering are the two types of recommended systems. So if I, uh, so for example, this slide, I'm not saying that this will be, but if it's something to do with MCQ questions, this could be an MCQ question, right? It's a very concept-wise kind of question that is like, what kind of, if I were to ask, uh, which two are considered recommender systems, you know, I'll put a few down there and you will know that maybe content filtering and collaborative filtering are the two that's been mentioned and other kind of filtering is not gonna be used for recommender systems. And that will be the kind of question that you can sort of expect from MCQ. So this is how you actually spot, uh, when you read a slide, uh, it would be recommended, it would be recommended, it would be, be uh, useful to know that uh, when you go into a slide, is this slide potentially can be an MCQ question? Because there's so many slides out there, right? So many slides for the five days. And for you, I think it's something that you guys need to sort of be able to differentiate. Certain slides are potentially can be uh, sort of exam materials and so on. So obviously, for, for this part, the part that you probably want to know, remember is recommender system is to provide suggestion. And then recommender system got two types, right? Got two types, content filtering and collaborative filtering. So that is the, the key point that you can get out of this slide, isn't it? So you either like to use highlighters or you like to note it down on another piece of paper as sort of like, uh, because in the exam time when you're doing rec when you're doing uh, revisions, we all have our own way of revision, right? Some of us would actually uh, get a new new notepad and then start writing stuff, basically trying to condense everything maybe onto one page. It's really up to you, but uh, the way to spot things that can be, and as you know now, the exam only consists of MCQ and hands-on, right? So MCQ, there's limited stuff that you can do in terms of MCQ. In the past, when we were sort of in high school or university, some exams, you have to fill in the blank, right? 
you have to answer the question by explaining something that will make your 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 revision a little bit more wider but mcq questions it can only have things it has to be things that you can select out of four right out of four or five five selections so there's very limited stuff that you can actually do so watch out for those uh when you when you come upon those in the in the sites a simpler way to think about this content filtering and the collaborative filtering is that we can talk about them in terms of items. So they explain content filtering and collaborative filtering. We have these kind of way of thinking about them. So first of all, we know that uh, there's content filtering and collaborative filtering. And now I want to tell you that in collaborative filtering, there's also two types of collaborative filtering. There's item to item and user to item. Let me explain what they are. So let's uh, let's talk about content filtering first. And content filtering is one of the easiest ones, which is one of the oldest types of filtering or or the way to recommend. If content filtering is almost like saying, if you like this item, you may also like. So what they are actually doing by this is filtering by content. For example, if you go into a shop. And for example, a grocery shop, and you buy things. And as a shop, if you are the owner of the shop, and how would you categorize people's purchases? Do you categorize, I mean, do you look at them in terms of transaction, or do you look at them as how many, uh, how many of this particular item has been bought? In terms of recommendations, you want to, you want to, be able to link certain products with other products, right? So that when somebody is buying this product, you can then recommend this product to that person, right? So that means um, content filtering, what it does is basically like if you are buying stuff um, that are usually bought together, for example, cereal and milk, uh, for example, um, burger and french fries, for these kind of stuff. And how do we know that those kind of stuff come together? Well, because if you take people's transactions, like one transaction slip, and there's items people bought, right? Stuff that people bought, which ones are constantly bought together? Those things are the things that are item to item, sort of, you know, if you like this, you might also like kind of situation. So it's, it's basically, uh, product to product kind of a linkage when two products are constantly bought together those products tend to be associated with one another so that is the content filtering so when you talk about content filtering it has nothing to do with people but it has to do with items all right i'm moving on to collaborative filtering so whenever we use the word collaborate Collaborate is to do with people and people, you know, they're helping each other to achieve a task or something like that, right? Collaboration. Collaboration. And so in this case, collaborative filtering is very much to do with people. And this is not a very uh, new, this is not a, it's not a very new concept, but it's newer than the content filtering because I mean, from the ancient times, people probably already know that if you're buying um, sort of bacon, you probably will buy eggs, you know, like, or if you're buying burger, you probably will be buy fries, you know, like these kind of stuff come together, like breakfast stuff, lunch stuff, or kind of um, pizza. If you wanted to make pizza dough, then you probably will buy cheese, right? Something like that. And, and when that, that is basically content filtering item to item collaborate you know, co item to item sort of you know these kind of connections and collaborative filtering has to do with people so item to item or user to item collaborative filtering is that customers who like this item also like so have you noticed that this instead of just simply just simply, if you like this item, you might also like this is based on this item's association with other items, right? Item to item collaboration, collaborative filtering is to do with people, people's preferences, 
um, the, because sometimes certain people buy certain things together. For example, uh, maybe women will buy certain things together with something else, um, and men will buy some other things together with something else, or men with a certain age range would actually do something. Uh, for example, um, customers who like this item also like, like for example, one customer, maybe this customer it has a newly born child. So if you have a newly born child, you will probably buy formula and diapers together, right? Or if you buy, uh, maybe for a new uh, newborn child, that means they, they probably buy diaper and then you buy something for the mother as well. Like the uh, newly uh, given birth kind of mother, they would buy some stuff. So it's like a person, what they will usually buy and what are the things that they usually buy together. So it's very much to do with the person instead of just items because we know that even though we consider ourselves as unique individuals, and sometimes I feel when I buy things and I, when I buy two things together, I am the unique one person who will only buy those two things together. But in fact, we are just people, right? We do things that maybe others do as well. And if people who are like us in terms of maybe our age, maybe our gender, maybe our job, or maybe our, you know, background. If people are similar to us, um, they would, we would probably have very similar kind of taste. But sometimes it's not quite the case. Sometimes maybe I will have very similar taste to uh, uh, middle age uh, or or maybe younger age guy or a um, or seventy year old guy as well. So it depends on our preferences. If two persons have very similar preferences, then they would actually use this as a collaborative filtering. So for example, you and uh, a 70 year old man both like books of detective books, right? And you bought um, Sherlock Holmes and, and also that person bought Sherlock Holmes and then he also bought um, Ian Ranking. So, so then, they would recommend you to actually get year ranking as well. So that kind of books that would actually link. It's based on somebody else's preference. Maybe somebody else has bought these things together and then they will recommend you because they see you buy one of these things and then they recommend the other thing to you based on another person's purchase. Not because, not because in general, things are usually bought together. So this content filtering is a very generalized universal association of items, right? This content filtering here, above here, it doesn't care if the person who bought this thing is a 40-year-old uh, uh, man or a 20-year-old woman. As long as things are bought together, they would be considered as associated. Whereas collaborative filtering right here, it has to do with very much of somebody else who bought something and then also bought something else. And then that preference is gonna influence your suggestion because you also bought one of the item that person bought. And so your, your suggestion, the suggestion for you would be, I'm gonna suggest the other item that person bought just because that person and you bought the same thing in your basket. So recommend the things that they bought to you. That is called item to item collaborative filtering because we don't care who the other person is as long as that person has bought the same thing as you did. So that's why we lead to the third one right here. It's called user item collaborative filtering. Means that the last, the last one right here is about people. It's nothing to do with what they bought. It's about who they, who people are. Meaning that um, this is the case where it says customers who are similar to you also like. So what is, what do you think another person who are similar like you is going to be like? Can you think of, so I think this is a very much sort of soul searching kind of situation. I don't really like to do that. Like, who are you? I don't want to know. I don't know. I don't care who I am. But sometimes it's like, oh, Mia, uh, I, I graduated here. I'm in engineering. I, at this age range, I, I don't earn very much. And then, and then basically, this is basically Mia. 
and they'll just look around the world and then look for another person who are like you. Ah, oh, this is there's another person who have very similar profiles as you do. Let's look at what that person buys. And then they'll recommend that person's purchase to you. This, I think, the user item collaboration here, for me, I think the user item collaboration is one of the, the least effective. Oh, well, I don't know, it could, I could be wrong. This user item collaborative filtering, because think about it, people who have the similar kind of backgrounds as us are usually people who we go to universities with, right? Similar age, similar background, similar subject. But we meet, but we and our friends or, or classmates, we could not be more different, right? Sometimes we don't like people we were, 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 were studying with. Sometimes we make, we make good friends with people that we're studying with, but we, you know, we don't like certain aspects of that person, but we like that person as a whole, right? So that means, Definitely, people, if they're like you, doesn't mean that they would actually have the same kind of preference as you do, right? But in terms of recommender systems is concerned, user item collaborative filtering is definitely a thing. Because I think if you have to generalize people, they will sort of generalize you as demographics, right? What about demographics? Demographics is, you know, age ranges, salaries, and how many kids you have, what kind of house do you buy, uh, which area do you live in, for example. Those kind of stuff are considered demographic information, right? And demographic information is, is if you think about it this way, you are no longer working where you work, you, you now work for a government agency who are trying to look at the whole country as a whole. So if you look at the whole country as a whole, how do you actually different categorize people? I think the most obvious one is by age range, right? Because supposedly if you're be, below 10 years old, you're considered sort of a very young person. If you're above 75 years old, you probably require old assistance and so on. So from a government's point of view or from a more overview kind of point of view, the user item collaborative filtering is actually something that is uh, quite useful because they can generalize the entire population and they can make the entire population, even though there's like millions of people, but you can actually categorize people within five categories, something like that, different age range, right? And to be able to generalize something also gives you the freedom to be able to do something about that uh, age range. So which is why the user item collaborative filtering here is looking at a sort of a more general terms of a uh, cluster, if you, if you may, or a, a general terms of separating people into their groups. And uh, with these three types of filterings, we are going to be able to use these to uh, recommend stuff to people. Maybe in the future there will be different types, even more different types of filtering, um, filtering uh, algorithms or strategies. But as of now, these two, these two or these three is considered the the top ones that to to use. In fact, the content filtering one is still one of the mainly used, mostly used by people because it's associating item to item and has nothing to do with people, right? So that means uh, the content filtering here, if people are concerned about privacy, perhaps you want to consider using the content filtering because the content filtering has nothing to do with people, right? It has nothing to do with people's profiles. It basically just goes through uh, looks at what kind of purchase uh, people are made usually with other things. So, so that is content and collaborative filtering. Mm -hmm. Content filtering, if I were to sort of show things like, um, for example, the, the filtering can be about hot selling stuff, things that is bought mostly by people, and the top rated movies in IMDb. Uh, how do you guys look for movies, by the way? Do you guys just follow friends or do you guys um, look for movies to watch, new movies to watch? I know nowadays with the RMCO and the MCO, stop going to movies, right? 
But before it happens, do you remember when you're looking for which movie to watch? What kind of sources do you look? Do you go for your friends' recommendations, or do you go for TV advertisements on movies, or do you actually,、um, you know, go to sort of, you know, like internet movie database to see what is the other people's、um, reviews about it? How do you guys actually look for movies to watch? I'm very curious because. Different people have different ways, right? Trailer, trailer. RDB, me too, me too. Me too. <laughs> any, anything else aside from trailers and IMDb? Do you guys use any other ones, or you're mainly going for this? I mean, sometimes, right? It depends on the situation. If I'm going to the movie by myself, I'm gonna go for IMDb, and because. Depends on who's in the movie. I can sort of tell whether it's going to be good or not, right? And and sometimes I may not use this at, at all. I mean, sometimes I'll just follow review Rotten Tomato. Oh, I see Rotten Tomato. Very critical, I think Rotten Tomato. Rotten Tomato. They have like if they don't, it's just like two, right? It's either Red Tomato or or Rotten, like the green spat. Or the or the red color tomato is like I love it or I hate it. Very very scary. So、um, sometimes I just go with friends, right? Because you want to spend time with friends, and then some. But some of your friends, my friends, may have really strong opinion about which one they want to watch, because there are so many movies in the in the in the theater, and my friend just happened to want to see that one. You know that single one.、And、I said, what about this one? It's already don't like. Okay, fine. <laughs> And then you just go with your friend's recommendation, right? But most of the times, when we look for、uh, movies to watch, we either go for trailers because trailers gives you a feel of whether that that movie is good or not. Also, right? You get to see a glimpse, a few minutes of that movie, and sometimes you go for IMDb. I think the IMDb is a little bit biased, especially when the movie is about to come out, because people who can see that movie either are from the production company. Or people who are actually in the background, who actually have some kind of association with the movie, because nobody else has seen it. What? Ah,、uh-huh, yeah, true. Yeah, 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 yeah. Or somebody who has who has read the book, right? The book behind it, and really loved the book, and thought, I think this movie is going to be great. And then basically just just say, I'm going to get it ten stars. And have you noticed that all of the so sort of, I don't know IMDb ratings, it always starts with a high, right? When you have only a hun- a few hundred people reviewed, it's always like seven point something, eight point something, or even nine point something. As soon as more people watch, it drops really drastically, isn't it? Yeah. So, so the be- initial part of the ratings I get from IMDb is not as、uh, not as accurate. But anyhow, people have different ways of going about looking for recommendations. So for me. For movies, especially, I go with.、Uh, I sometimes also look at trailers on YouTube. There's a website that actually deals that shows trailers, right? There is one channel that actually shows all trailers, isn't it? So future movies. But with the with the、um, pandemic and stuff, I think new movies are coming out less and less because they cannot really get people to go to the theaters, right? And their box office is going to tank, and that's not good. So. So in the future, we may have to watch Netflix or or other sort of streaming first before before new stuff come out. Yeah, that's a shame. But at some point in the future, I'm sure we're gonna be going back to IMDb and watching, looking for content, looking for new movies again. It'll all go back to normal, hopefully. Collaborative filtering is to do with how people, how other people are. Are watching? Have you guys ever been to YouTube and go and click on trending? Never. I only click on trending when it get when I get bored of all the stuff I've subscribed to. So so okay so、um, when I go to in the past when I go to YouTube I usually just go to home, and then I realize in the YouTube home they're not all of the stuff that I have subscribed to. They're they're stuff that that that's sort of like it's a It's a mix up between channels that I've、um, <clears throat> subscribed to and the channels they want you to watch, right? So from then onwards, I only bookmark the、um, the subscription 
and it goes to all the stuff that I'm subscribed to. And sometimes when, when I watch a lot and I watch all of them already, I was thinking nothing to watch anymore, then, which is quite rare, I know, but, but then I just click on trending and trending is based on the country, right? I think the trending thing, it depends on which country you actually are, are putting yourself to. I don't know if you guys checked out because if you go to your YouTube settings and if you don't put Malaysia and you put USA, it will give you trending stuff from USA. Yeah. Okay, so right here, this 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 advertisement here is a uh, is from a company called Harvey Nichols. Harvey Nichols. It's a uh, I think it's a British company that is deals with high end designer clothes and. Each of those shoes are really, really expensive. And this is an advertisement based on recommendations. So it's like, uh, this is an advertisement. They're trying to sell shoes, right? They're trying to sell shoes. And then they also says, if you buy this item, you may also want to buy this item. And if you're looking close into that, that particular item, if you're cl looking close into that item, eh? It is actually a altitude sickness kind of pills. So you because you wear high heels, ma, you'll be on high altitude if you if you wear it. So so they're trying to show that they are really um, caring to their to their customer, and then uh, is recommending altitude sickness be, uh, for wearing very very high heels. Increased number of things sold. Uh, so these are the benefits of using recommender system. I mean, I don't really need to say too much about what the benefits. We all know what are the benefits, right? Get to sell more stuff, sell more stuff. But if you look into more cl closely, it's not just about selling more stuff, which is the first one, increase the number of items sold. Yes, it is. But what it's actually also trying to do is trying to get you out of your, your purchase mold, means that they are trying to get you to buy stuff that you don't normally buy, right? Not just the same kind of items. They are trying to get you to buy other type of items that you never bought before. So sell more diverse items. Sell more diverse items. And then and then they're they're thinking, oh, I'm giving you recommendations. And if these recommendations work for you, then that means you'll come back for more recommendations. That will increase my your your guys' loyalty uh, because you're more satisfied. So increase customer satisfaction. And then increase customer loyalty. So increase loyalty, it just means that you'll stick with this company more because such a huge competition nowadays. I mean, even in telco, there's only how many telcos in, in Malaysia? Eight. So many. Yeah. Isn't it Max Maxis Cellcom DG? U Mobile. U Mobile. What did you do? <laughs> you you do you do you do is from you do is from one com is is from cellcom right if that doesn't count cellcom is is by itself if that's the case xpax is also considered or or imaxis hotlink also consider they're the same right not the same uh, different company uh. oh Ah, uh, I use thing called what is it called? Okio. Have you guys heard of it? And then it shut down. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes, yes. So I just never thought of Okio as being by itself. I just consider it as a sort of a prepaid by 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 Maxis, because at the end of the day, they're using the Maxis line, right? Yes, because they cannot hack it. In the in the very competitive world of uh, telcos, sometimes people do lose out. So in my mind, it's always Maxis DG and Cellcom and maybe U-Mobile, right? Those are the four main ones, isn't it? Other ones are subsidiaries, subsidiaries of the main ones. Hotlink is considered Maxis, right? No, man? 
for example, like, okay, if you're talking about Axiata and Cellcom, but even though Cellcom is under Axiata, right? So oh, all of these things are getting too confusing. Anyhow, anyhow, so even with the telco stuff, have you guys, how many of you have been with one telco for more than five years? Really? Cellcom? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I used to be with MMU and MMU is under uh, T, T, uh, TM, right? So so a lot of our colleagues are using Cellcom stuff. I never use Cellcom stuff. <laughs> I feel a bit bad about it, but but because the area that I'm in, Cellcom is a bit slow, or it sometimes breaks a bit. So so it's hard to if you're in a sort of a hurry that you need to get in contact with your friend and then you suddenly see no bar. That's very stressful. So, so even for me, I have jumped from one to another all the time because sometimes this one have better promotion, sometimes another one have better promotion, and so on. So, to increase customer loyalty is actually one of the hugest big deals for telcos because there are only so many people in the country, right? The population is never going to change. If somebody subscribes to you, that means some other telco is losing out, right? Some telco is actually losing people because those people are coming to your company. So the, it's like the whole thing about um, uh, how how the, the the Apple and the Google phones are getting a little bit saturated. Not many people are buying those phones because the, the world population is not going to increase, right? Everybody has a phone already, and they're pretty good. So the purchase of phones actually doesn't really increase you know, indefinitely. So loyalty is so important. There, have you guys heard of a thing called churn? Only the places that have subscription will have this thing about churn, right? I never really cared about churn until, until because my parent company are doing this project that actually have to analyze customer churn. Customer churn, the word churn, it means people who are moving from your company subscription, subscription to another company, right? which also means that you'll be losing a, uh, avenue or uh, revenue because your customer subscribers is moving from away from you to another, another place. And it's been said that it's much harder to recruit new customers than it is to retain current customers. So the customer loyalty is so important for a certain, certain industry, especially in the telco company, right? Telco company try to spend so much money to retain their subscribers. And there is a reason because the competition is so high and so, so very competitive. Customer loyalty is so important. Uh, in the future, I think at the moment, Shopee and Lazada are the two e-commerce companies that is out there that is quite high up there, right? So they are still doing... and. Have you guys noticed that Lazada used to be so much more popular than Shopee? And nowadays, for some reason, Shopee has gone up, right? So even with the top two companies are actually having so much competition, it's unbelievable. And, and the last one here is called better understanding of what customer wants. Because if you get people to buy stuff you recommend, it means that you're doing a good job, right? Because when you give recommendation and people don't click on it, it's very easy to, to track people's click rates, right? If, they, if you recommend some stuff and people don't go and click on it, there will be a count of how many people click on something or not. If they don't click on it, it means that your, your suggestion wasn't good enough even just to browse, you know? So if you get people to buy stuff that you recommend, it shows that you are actually on the right track. On the other hand, if you don't get people to even click on it, it shows that you need to improve your recommender system, right? Your recommender system does not do its job, and somebody at the data science department needs to really you know, up their game, which is, which is um, what we're going to be talking about a bit more. At the moment, is 10.20. We're going to go for a bit of a morning break. You guys ready for morning break? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay, let's go for some breakfast, all right? And then we'll be back here at uh, 10.45, right? Okay. All right, so let's go for some breakfast. <laughs>